The non-farm payroll and unemployment rate numbers actually came in better than the expectations on Friday morning, and because of that, we're trading well above a key pivot zone in the S&P based on the abbreviated future session. We'll talk about all of that and more in today's episode of the Weekly Watchlist. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button, and subscribe. Make sure you stay tuned until the very end of today's episode because I've got five additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this previous week, we're certainly dealing with an indecisive doji, which is not indicative of buyers or sellers having a particular edge if we're looking at structure in isolation. Of course, we've got a relatively equal sized upper and lower wick, and we've closed unchanged on the week. There is a slight edge to the buyers because yes, Technically, this is a green bodied bar, but for the most part, neutral based on structure alone, where the bullish edge really starts to shine through is if we start to consider the location and context around this bar. So on the bar to bar count, we have certainly produced a significant higher low as well as a higher high, which I would now start to classify on the weekly time frame chart as a three bar setting up here. A three bar play means that we have momentum in bar number one, that is this first breakout bar. Bar number two is always indicative of consolidation and a brief pause, and I totally get it. It's light trading volume. It's a shortened holiday trading week, but nonetheless, it is still a pause. And if we can clear bar number two and one's high, we're looking for that momentum to continue in the market to take us to the next weekly pivot here, which is just shy of SPY 420. So that does strike me as a bullish nuance from a location perspective in the upward direction. But further than that, we know that this large red bodied bar right here represents the banking crisis failure. Of course, there was a complete rejection of that banking crisis move. The market has closed above that in the previous weekly bar. But notice that as this consolidation unfolds, we never even dip a toe into the body of the red breakdown bar. So overall, again, bullish nuance here if we're looking at location. Now, let's not forget about trend. If we isolate the trend to this box right here, we're, of course, dealing with lows, higher lows, higher lows, and we're looking for the equal high to be made to continue this weekly uptrend. Because we've closed above the top of this breakdown bar high a number of times now, I would say that it's less likely or less of a focus for the market to think about this as the potential head and shoulders pattern. Ideally, the right shoulder would have formed somewhere underneath the top of the banking crisis candle. It's simply not the case as of the previous week's close. If we scrunch this chart up a little bit and throw on our anchored view apps from the all-time high as well as the October bottom. Notice that for the majority of last week's worth of consolidation, we spent our time above the anchored view at band, which does strike me as a bullish nuance. If we go ahead and throw on the high volume nodes as well from the volume profile, we're pushing away from the high volume node in the upward direction here, which once again does strike me as a bullish nuance. We're trying to rotate through the low volume void into the next overhead high volume node, which is that SPY 420 pivot from right here. Now, in the grand scheme of things, let's not lose track of the fact that as long as we're in this box on the weekly time frame chart, there's really not much of a trend. Again, from the nuanced perspective that we have lows, higher lows, higher lows, it is a short-term uptrend, but things do become much more meaningful when and if we can break 420 in the upward direction. On the daily time frame chart, let's evaluate the expected move here. If you're not familiar with this study, top right-hand corner's got you covered with a brief tutorial. If we're contained by the upper edge of the weekly expected move, notice that that would, of course, imply a higher high being produced over last week's high, breaking the weekly three-bar play in the upward direction, and it is also suggestive of the equal high being made on the weekly time frame chart. The number is roughly 416.75. If we're contained by the lower edge of the weekly expected move, the number is 401.50, give or take, and that does keep us above our line in the sand at SPY 401. So overall expected move here does strike me as a bullish implication. Keep in mind that these numbers were produced before the NFP number on Friday actually came out. So we will reevaluate on the Monday session. From a trend perspective, I think it's fair to say that the daily trend has reversed and is in a full blown uptrend at this point in time. With higher lows on the table, we know that there's still wiggle room down to 401. But for the most part, we're also getting highs higher highs here as well. And again, the expected move is suggesting the opportunity for another higher high. So daily trend is up. We saw a very minor pullback 
on the Tuesday and Wednesday session of last week. We saw a hammer candle produced on the daily time frame chart, and we're actually above that hammer high at 409 as of the futures close from the Friday abbreviated session. I can show you that here on our ES. This is the Thursday high. This is the Friday before the market actually shuts down for the Good Friday holiday. But you can see we're above that candle's high. So if we go back on over to the SPY daily chart, we can assume that that equivalent futures move is somewhere in here. Because we're above that hammer high, I think it's fair to say that this pullback is trying to resolve in the upward direction. Therefore, we should be thinking about upside targets first. The first one is here coming in at 413.25. And after that, the expected move high and weekly equal high at again, 416.75. This would be a very minor pullback. And we'll talk about the nuance of the bullish activity on the hourly chart in just a moment. I do want you to remember that there's plenty of wiggle room down to 401. It's not the end of the world if this pullback does continue. We'll talk about bearish setups to get involved in that downdraft, but we still have at 401 the daily 50 SMA. If we come in with the Fibonacci's from the low, up to the high, we've still got our bullish 38.2 consolidations being suggested above 401, correct? And if we come in with our anchored view apps attached to all the key pivots after the October bottom, notice that we're well above the view app band and slowly over time, these will start to creep up and provide confluence of super support at 401. So that's fantastic, but let's move on down to an hourly time frame chart and talk about the hourly uptrend here and the pullback that we got. So if we come in with the trend channel from the lows, do something like this and bring out our resistance trend line. Notice that we did produce the double top. We've talked about this at the upper edge of the trend channel. 409 is the neckline of that pattern and also the hammer high of the Thursday session, or excuse me, Friday session. <laughs> what am I saying? Wednesday session. There we go. Shortened weeks throw everything off. But nonetheless, we're trading above this 409. So that also implies a recapture of the double top neckline. I'm not saying we need to rally all the way to the upper bound of the trend channel, but you can start to reason that any higher lows, so continued pullbacks that do something like this, look really attractive to position close to 409, target 413.25 with a stop underneath. Risk reward there certainly makes sense. Now, as we discussed, Discussed, we said that there's still room to pull back into 401. How do we get involved on a downside trade? Well, bears wouldn't really be making all that much progress, but we can trade it short in the downward direction on a flush of this double bottom right here. So let's grab our price level tool and just put this in on the hourly time frame chart under 406.13. I think you can start to look for some flushes down into that 401 area. The reason I'm really uh, interested in that level if we do see further pullback is because of specifically the psychology from Thursday session. Let's think about what took place here. On the Thursday morning session, technically there is some downside momentum. Notice that we sweep the lows of the Wednesday session. There's no follow through from the sellers and what takes place. We know that there's a big reversal in the upward direction. We close at the highs and right at that key pivot, 409. So if the stronger sellers were going to enter this market, there was a great excuse for them to do so for the deeper pullback underneath Wednesday's lows. It simply didn't happen on the Thursday morning session right here. So because of that, I am seeing further evidence for bullish activity taking place once again, with the implied open being above 409, any healthy pullbacks that look like this. I think it's game on for some of these upper targets, 413.25, then ultimately the equal high on the weekly, 416.75. We talked about downside. We talked about upside. Let's get into some supporting evidence. Market internals are exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, top right-hand corner's got you covered with a brief tutorial. For the most part, the internals last week were extremely neutral or even mild at best. The reason I say that is because from a volume flows perspective, net on the week, we're only down negative 250 million. Significant is negative 500 million or worse. In terms of the advanced decline line, we're tangled up around the zero line. Tuesday is the only day where I would say there was actually a serious threat. Wednesday, we trend higher even though we're in the negative zone. And then of course on Thursday, we're tangled up around zero again. The same thing could be said about the cumulative builds in the tick. Notice that the only bad day is really Tuesday. Everything else is fairly mild on both sides of the coin, which begs the question, should we believe in the rally from the Thursday session if it's not being supported by significant inflows here on the Thursday session? The advanced decline line is tangled around zero, not in the trend higher zone, and the cumulative tick takes a while to get positive and even fades off into the close. So if you recall from the SPY analysis, we said that we needed a higher low above 
409. And the reason for that is we need the evidence that yes, buyers are stepping up here because we're not getting the support from the internals on the Thursday session. If the internals on Thursday were screaming bullish, everything was you know good to go locked and loaded on the upside, that's a different story. But right now we need higher lows above SPY 409 or in the ES, higher lows above 4135. If this is the case and supported by bullish internals on the Monday session or early next week, basically, that would be much more confidence inspiring for the upside. But based on Thursday's rally not being supported by the internals, we need that extra layer of confirmation, aka the higher low that we've just been discussing. Exhibit B is the market profile video tutorial on the top right hand corner if you're not familiar with this screen. For the most part, we just want to focus on the Thursday session because of the nuance that it provides us with. The first thing is that the low of Thursday actually sweeps the low of Wednesday. We saw that on the hourly time frame chart, but notably, it cleans up the poor low from the Wednesday session. Now, after that, we can also see we get a double distribution on the Thursday session. And what's noteworthy is that value, of course, is overlapping to up compared to the Wednesday value. That's the highlighted area right here and right here, but also the point of control clearly closes in the upper distribution, signaling to the market that yes, buyers are willing to commit volume at the higher prices instead of the lower prices on the day's session. Now, this does mean that if we do get a failure to hold up on this gap up from the NFP numbers on the Monday session early on, all eyes should be on the closure of the single prints right here. We basically treat this as if it were a gap. You can see the very thin volume in the volume profile and when and if that closes down to 41.14.50, that's where we're looking for a reversal. So a very nuanced take for the market would be, okay, if we fail on Monday here, fall into the prior day's range, we should technically do something like this if we are going to maintain bullish structure. The last thing I would point out from a market profile perspective is that the point of control, very nuanced here, but it did technically close above the breakdown bar from the Tuesday session where we know the market internals were actually the most bearish. So that is progress in the upward direction. Moving back on over to Thinkorswim to evaluate the weekly performance of our sectors reveals that utilities continues to lead the pack here up 3.5% roughly, followed by healthcare, then communications, and the only other green name on the board is consumer staples. As we said on Wednesday, one of these things is not like the other. Communications is the only risk on sector. Everything else is much more indicative of that nasty R word, the recession theme that we talked about on Wednesday. At the bottom of the barrel, we see industrials here, followed by discretionary and energy, the XLK heaviest weight tech sector. It's kind of flat on the week, only down 0.68%. Let's take a look at the structural charts and evaluate what's going on from a trend perspective. So utilities, big breakout on the Wednesday session as investors potentially seek a safe haven and a dividend from the utilities companies if we're fearing recession. And you'll notice that from a technical perspective, we've broken the double bottom neckline. And there's certainly a strong opportunity for a constructive higher low anywhere above that neckline here at 67.75. So don't get me wrong, bullish pressure is bullish pressure. But from a posturing perspective, perspective, not really what we want to see if we're looking for a risk on move in the S&P 500. Next up, healthcare, XLV, what's going on? Basically a vertical move last week straight into resistance. So prior rejections, all of these rejections in here also acted as previous support a number of times. 133.50, because of the nature of this move and how we've arrived at this location, I would be really watching closely for a pullback in the coming weeks worth of trade. Recall that this is the second heaviest weighted sector of the S&P. So if this is pulling back a aggressively and there's no you know sort of follow up from the XLK moving in the upward direction kind of spells pullback in the S&P or continued chop at least and not really looking for that big continuation move that the weekly chart could potentially suggest into 116.75. Next up, XLC, what's going on in communications? Notice that we're coming into or trying to get back to, I should say, this $60 area on this chart. Now, overall, very constructive look with the hammer candle high breaking on the Thursday session after sweeping the low. So that does strike me that sellers had their opportunity, just like we talked about on the SPY hourly, but notice that there's more follow through in the upward direction here specifically on the XLC. So really watching for the move into 60 and then reevaluating for a pullback. This does strike me as bullish and uh, looking quite good for the S&P, but it's one data point among all of these other risk off sectors that we're seeing, uh, you know, outperforming in the past week's worth of trade. Um, in terms of the move in the consumer staples sector, notice that once again, it was almost a straight shot into previous resistance. This isn't the strongest resistance. I would 
definitely start to think about 7625 acting as the more meaningful area of potential rejection. But nonetheless, getting outside of this balance range certainly offers any constructive higher lows above 74. From a posturing perspective, once again, not great. Upward pressure is still upward pressure, but posture is not looking fantastic. Industrials is where the cookie starts to crumble, so to speak. Terrible analogy for the market. But nonetheless, uh, notice that we've got a three bar play in the downward direction. So the exact opposite of what we just discussed on the SPY weekly time frame chart. We failed to maintain a higher low above the top of the double bottom neckline in here. This does strike me as a threat for the S&P. So watching for a flush of these lows, ideally we just test these double bottom lows at 95.75 and don't even bother to get hung up at the bottom of the range at 96.75. So bearish pressure out of the XLI. Really not happy with this until we can put in a higher low back above 98.70. So that's a big threat there. XLY, what's going on with discretionary? It's got to get in gear. Uh, this is the one thing that really needs to start picking up the slack if the risk on look is going to remain in the market. On the Thursday session, we attempted a hammer off of the support trend line. It just needs the follow through now, and it really needs to clear this area with some strength, aka higher lows above. Otherwise, it's just hard to say that we have a full blown risk on type look in the market. As long as we're under 148, very, very difficult to see that upside follow through in the S&P XLY. It's got to start pulling its weight. As we'll see on the tech sector, it's already done its job. It really needs the supporting sectors at this point in time. Next up is energy. Notice that we are hanging on to the gap up gains from the OPEC production cut. So I would just watch very mechanical levels here, either continuation over 87.50 or a gap close underneath 84.25. I would say if energy does make the move into that gap and closes it, that does strike me as more of a uh, constructive look posture wise for the S&P, noting that if energy prices come down, it's continuing to reinforce the idea that inflation is kind of in the rearview mirror. If this gets out of control up and over like, you know, $100 in the XLE, totally different story. We will reevaluate if that does become the case. But for now, continuing along, XLB materials, not much to talk about here. Thin structure underneath us after a full retracement of this move. But notice a couple of green bars here into the end of last week. I'm not convinced that it wants to go easily, but if we do get price acceptance, aka a lower high underneath 79.15, it's basically a retest of the double bottom neckline. So potentially slight bearish pressure early on in the week if we flush that area. But recall, this is a really lightweight sector. It's not going to it's not going to make or break the S&P. So here's the XLK, right? It's already done its job. This is what I meant when I was talking on the XLY needing to support more of the risk on look. We've already seen a significant breakout in the tech sector. Uh, notice that again, this, this does look constructive to me, sweeping the lows of Wednesday, closing back up at the highs on the Thursday session, looking for the follow through equal high here at 151.50. But if this is just going to consolidate after that, that's where we need the slack to be picked up by the XLY. And as of right now, it has the opportunity with that hammer candle, but it's got to get above 148. Otherwise, I'm just not convinced. Next up, we've got the real estate sector. Much lighter weight has much more to do with the wealth effect. Really getting tight in a range here with the sweep of the lows. I'm not going to you know, repeat everything, but you get the idea. It does look slightly more bullish than bearish for a move higher here. And last but not least, we've got the XLF where there does continue to be some pain. Notice that we fell back down into the balance range and we certainly are not aggressively reclaiming the top of the range. So this is the range. Look above, failed back into the range. We didn't flush the lows. We talked about this on Wednesday, 3165. We're still above, but for this to be bullish, it's got to be the, we need the proof. Show me the money, right? Show me the evidence. It's got to be the higher low in many of these sectors. So XLF higher low needs to be achieved. XLY higher low needs to be achieved. Other than that, it's pretty difficult right now to say from a posture perspective that the market's poised well for a full-blown reversal. Here's the ratio grid. If you don't know how to set it up, video tutorial in the top right-hand corner. For the most part, these are the heavyweight sectors, not the risk-on sectors, the heavyweight sectors. XLK is continuing to be the glue to keep risk on, held together, paired with, as we know, the XLC down below, which is the only really good-looking chart for the risk-on cohort. For the most part, this stalling out here, once again, we need the slack to be picked up by the XLY. Does this chart indicate that? Absolutely. Absolutely not. By no stretch of the imagination, you know, a failure of the 50 SMA going sideways in this range, making a new lower low on the Thursday session. It's a threat. It's certainly a threat. We're not seeing that continued sideways like, okay, this is just a pullback. It's starting to become more than that as we threaten the breakdown of this range in here. The XLV healthcare sector, as we pointed out earlier, is a recession type indication as this is breaking out. Uh, look, we've made a new higher high. So not really great from a posturing perspective. Financials continue to get absolutely smoked in the downward direction. If we take a look at the bottom four, these are the lightweight sectors that really have less impact, but again, show us a lot about posture. XLP, sideways threatening a potential move higher now that we've reclaimed and are staying above the 50 SMA. XLU recaptured the 50 SMA. Energy, a little bit of rejection here, which once again is why we're paying close attention to that gap. But for the most part, risk on 
it's not really there as this XLK only is going sideways and isn't continuing its trajectory in the upward direction, not being supported by the XLY either, trying to get back above that 50 SMA. This could all change on Monday, but as of right now, posture-wise, the market's not really looking great, which is completely contrary to the price action analysis that we did earlier. So if you're skeptical of this market, I can understand why, but if you're an S&P trader, you follow S&P price and posture comes as a secondary metric specifically if you're a day trader. If you're an investor, completely different story, I get it. Let's take a look at the XLY over the XLP and see what's going on from a risk on versus risk off posture, growth versus value basically is how you think of this. And notice that again, we have rejected here twice now the 50 SMA. We're threatening a breakdown of these lows. We haven't done it yet. It will become much more concerning when and if we actually break down. But for the most part, this isn't really convincing for an upside move or risk on posture, just another way to visualize it. Having a look at the dollar, you'll notice that we are still breaking down from this overhead balance here, but it's finally being reflected in equities with higher prices, restoring that quote unquote classic relationship of lower dollar, higher equities. Now the concern will be if the dollar continues to fall and equities then start to fall in sync, once again, that is much more indicative of the recession type theme. But on the Thursday rally, kind of put that relationship back in order, if you will. So we'll continue to monitor it, watching for equities to continue to rally if the dollar continues to drop. And with the rejection from the bottom of the range, on the Thursday session high, it does look like the dollar can continue in the downward direction. This is also being confirmed by the gold contract. If we look at the GC, recall that we had a beautiful pennant set up on the daily time frame chart. Break and retest is now on the table for this 2000 level in the GC. If you're not going to trade the GC, you can do so in the GLD uh, ETF. GLD is the ticker. If I could type, we could go GLD and take a look. It's at 185. That's the number to be watching in the GLD contract. But even better might be the silver trade. Okay, so silver, the slept on metal is putting in a four bar play, three bar play, however you want to classify it, double inside, whatever. Hammer candles setting up an equal high breakout point at 2522. The break is into 2635 coming from a previous pivot from back in here. Now, the silver contract in futures is not for the faint of heart. The tick size is half a penny, so 005, and the tick value is $25 per half penny that it moves. So if you're not comfortable trading the silver futures, I would move on over to, again, the ETF equivalent, which is gonna be SLV. Your numbers to watch here are gonna be 23 on the breakout point. The target would be the pivot high from here at 24.16. You probably wanna do it with options to capture some leverage. Let's take a look at what's going on with interest rates. An interesting comment for interest rates, specifically because of the weekly underperformance from the XLK tech sector, coming in basically flat down 0.68%. Why was tech not outperforming uh, to a higher degree as interest rates were basically falling off of a cliff in the last week's worth of trade. It's kind of a head scratcher and once again, more indicative of that recessionary type theme. So you can see from a posture perspective, again, all of these mixed signals right now. Now, based on the NFP, the expectation is that Jerome Powell will probably issue another 25 basis point rate hike in the May meeting and rates did actually move higher on that Friday session. Speaking of rates, let's take a look at the tracker tool. So you can see here how the NFP release dramatically changed the expectations of the market now signaling for a 25 basis point rate hike in the May meeting. That would bring the terminal rate up to 500 to 525 basis points, which is dramatically different from the expected pause we were expecting at 475 to 500. And you'll notice here that the pause stays for two meetings at 500 to 525, two meetings at 575 to 500, and then the aggressive rate cuts start coming in as we approach the end of 2023 and even early into 2024. This is completely different than what we saw as the banking crisis was unfolding. We were never even considering getting to these terminal rates here, and it was just cut, 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 cut. The market is like doomed. Everything's going to go to zero. So as the fundamental data has come out, the market has reassessed and said, hey, things actually aren't all that bad. If we take a look at the numbers that were released on Friday, we did a little Twitter thread on it. You can go and check that out on Twitter. It's at Trade Brigade Co. You can see the hourly earnings came in at the expectation 0.3. What does this tell the Fed? Well, there's no indication of a wage price spiral and so far so good on the fight versus inflation. You can also see the non-farm employment change came in at 236 versus the expected 228. So folks are continuing to get jobs. Maybe we see a recession that has relatively low unemployment, which brings me to the last number here, which is the unemployment rate, it was lower than the expectation. So barring all of the anecdotal evidence about the massive tech layoffs that are taking place right now, 
People are remaining employed, we are adding jobs, and there is really no threat of a high unemployment recession, at least as of right now. The data is subject to change, but this is why the market's pricing in another 25 basis point rate hike to really make sure that inflation is driven into the ground, we can withstand it from an economic perspective, considering this fundamental data. It just sort of makes sense that, you know, why wouldn't Jerome Powell continue with the rate hiking campaign to get to that 500 terminal rate? We're really going to see these numbers, you know, get all wacky once again this week, because on Wednesday, we've got CPI coming out. We're going to get some FOMC meeting minutes at two o'clock. This is not the FOMC meeting itself. It's just the meeting minutes. There shouldn't really be anything new in there unless they make a comment on the NFP. Then we'll get the PPI numbers and then retail sales coming in on the Friday session as well. So a jam-packed week, again, full of fundamental data. Keep your wits about you. But so far, as long as the data comes in good, the market should respond favorably to good news. Taking a look at the TLT bonds, they are yet to break out over 110, and the flight to safety trade indicator down at the bottom is actually fading off in the downward direction. Now, when and if the TLT breaks out over 110, if this perks up in a big way, we will certainly be the first ones to let you know and say, hey, red flags going off for equities down below. As of right now, as this fades off, it's certainly indicating comfort, so to speak, with risk assets at this point in time. We'll keep a very close eye on this one specifically. Another thing that's worth keeping an eye on into the coming weeks worth of trade is the HYG. This is something I would certainly recommend keeping up intraday just because of how nuanced it's been over the past couple of trading weeks. We recall that these are the two equivalent ranges in the HYG and the S&P. It kept us level-headed here. It kept us level-headed here. We know that. But look at how far extended the S&P is now from the range, whereas the HYG is threatening a look above and fail. If we find ourselves trading at 73 in the HYG, that should be a massive red flag for the S&Ps if we're continuing to maintain bullish consolidation up here. I wouldn't really trust it as far as I can throw it. The bullish look for the HYG would be taking out this pivot high here roughly around, what's the number, uh, 75.50. That would start to confirm more bullish consolidation in the S&P 500. Let's take a look at the digital gold and see what's going on over here. The pattern is actually looking eerily similar. This is a weekly chart, so it's not quite the same as silver, but you get the idea that it's a multiple sort of consolidation type look at the highs of a breakout bar. Can we see continuation? That certainly would imply more of a risk appetite for our markets. And I get it. We'll continue to say this disclaimer every single time. It is not one to one with the S&Ps, much more closely tied to the NASDAQ. But for the most part, this is actually indicative of risk taking. The market breadth is certainly improving, but it's not as good as it needs to be to be a full blown bullish look. I think we could use a couple more Altoids mints to clean up that bad breath. But for the most part, the new highs versus lows is sitting right on the zero line, obviously much more constructive if we can maintain more of a bullish stance above in the positive zone. We are making a stride above above the 50% mark in the SPX A200R. This is stocks trading above their daily 200 SMA in the S&P 500. So this is okay. But again, more meaningful is pushing in this upward direction, getting away from a threatening look like what we experienced in 2022. We're just too close to the 50% mark for my liking. If we take a look at the SPX A50R, this is stocks trading above the 50 SMA, and this is a daily time frame chart now. As this pullback has unfolded, I wanna point out that this big break in the upward direction very, very minor pullback, right? So not all of the companies that have seen a pullback just you know, threw their hands up and gave up the 50 SMA on the pullback. This does strike me as constructive. It's a signal that, hey, a lot of companies are actually staying above the 50 SMA, even though we saw two very minor days of pullback. Let's take a look at the RSP now, which is the equal weight S&P. This is where there are starting to become some more clear red flags. It's a great thing that we're holding up above 141. We do not want to fall back into this range, but notice the divergence at the highs. We're much closer to threatening a break of the S&P highs, the weighted S&P highs versus the equal weight S&P. It's just not even close to 155 yet. So if this you know, is going to maintain a healthy relationship between the two, if the market breadth is going to improve, we've really got to get in gear here in the RSP. Right now, this certainly falls on the side of the narrative that supports the bearish thesis from a fundamental perspective and now a technical perspective. This ties in nicely with that idea. Having a look at volatility, certainly sitting on the lows and underneath 2050 once again, this does strike me as a comfortable look for this holding as a higher low on the daily time frame chart slash weekly time frame chart. Let's take a look one step further behind the curtain at the volatility of the volatility index. This is the VVIX, and it is currently in the midpoint of its range, so it's not quite floored at 75. We don't have to yet deal with the complacency effect, but it is indicating comfort in the VIX itself. Now, I know everybody always gets tangled up about 30-day options not being, or excuse me, shorter time frame than 30-day options being registered in the VIX, and this sort of dispels that as well. So this up top,
Shop is inclusive of 30-day options, and obviously, Strong Contango here. This is the 9 versus 30-day VIX, so this includes shorter dated options than 30 days, and lo and behold, it's strongly underneath the zero line, once again indicative of being in a contango. So right now, there is less risk in the present day, more risk in the unknown future. Therefore, money managers are more apt to allocate capital now instead of waiting at some point in the future. A lot of talk about a black swan right now, especially if you're on social media, Twitter specifically. I'm just not seeing it in the cards that we have in front of us. Jumping on over to our QQQ weekly time frame chart, let's talk about candle structure and location just like we did in the S&P. Here you'll notice that we do have more of a hammer type candle, but it does have a red bar. So that's a slight concession, but nonetheless, it does feel more optimistic for a break of these two highs, which are more equal than what we saw in the S&P 500 itself. So a crack of the three bar highs, look left, your next overhead target is really coming in closer to 330 on the QQQ weekly time frame chart. And even if we do pull back, notice that there's a clear opportunity for a higher low to develop on the weekly time frame, considering that we have lows, higher lows, looking for a higher low after producing what? A weekly higher high. So all good from a trend count perspective. And just like the S&P, although we were looking at the breakdown bar high, notice that this pivot high acted as support in the lower wick of the previous week's worth of trade. Once again, from a location standpoint, I do think that the buyers are building a slight edge. If we scrunch this chart up to reveal the volume profile on the weekly, we're pushing away from this really high volume node in the upward direction. And if we can clear, this is where I think things get really interesting. If we can start this breakout over last week's swing high, look left. There's not a whole lot of volume structure until this high volume node way up above at 360. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not calling for this in the coming week's worth of trade. I'm just saying that if a larger bottom is being put in place here in the QQQ, if this is potentially a weekly cup and handle, whatever, the breakout could be sizable. From a measured move perspective, doing something like this and stacking it on the breakout point, it brings us right into this area. So something to be mindful of on the weekly time frame chart. On the QQQ daily time frame chart, we can see the expected move is bullish just like the S&P, suggesting a higher high being produced or a continued higher low pullback above our line in the sand at 307.50. Why 307.50? Well, if we take out the Fibonacci's from the low of the move up to the high of the move, that is right where our 38.2 is. It would also imply some sort of gap fill reversal staying above 307.50. So expected move here does strike me as bullish. The same psychology about sweeping the low of Wednesday session, closing at the highs on the Thursday session also applies here in the QQQ, just like it did on the S&P 500. If we take a look at the hourly time frame chart, you can see it clear as day here. There's the sweep in the morning, close at the highs, and also above the very obvious neckline of the double top here on the QQQ. So the idea, just like in the S&P, is for a higher low to form somewhere above 317.50, trade for the equal highs at the double top area, and a breakout over 320.50. Let's go back to the daily time frame chart. There is some room to run towards the upper edge of the expected move, and then next structure is much closer to 328. If we take a look at the market internals for the QQQ, you'll notice that it was actually a little bit more bearish as the pullback was unfolding in the last week's worth of trade. A little bit more bearish Monday, Tuesday, as well as Wednesday. But Thursday, notice how we don't just cling to the zero line. There is a little bit of a positive build here, but nonetheless, still net outflows on the week, closing right at the cusp of significant negative 530 million in the QQQ internals. If we take a look at the advanced decline line, a little bit more of a significant push away from the zero line on the Thursday session. And in the cumulative ticks, I mean, this is there's just no arguing, right? It's more bearish on the Tuesday and Wednesday session. So some more work to be done in the QQQ underpinnings if this break is uh, going to be true in the upward direction, which is why, once again, I would be very mindful of the higher low that's required first before getting involved in the upside and just blindly buying this early on in the session. From an NQ perspective, your level would be roughly 13,185. And lastly, we've got the IWM weekly time frame chart. You should be fairly concerned about what you're seeing in front of you here. Certainly a same size body lining up. This one is red, so we need to go with the most recent bar, of course. Big look above and fail. We'll talk about it on the daily time frame chart. But nonetheless, from a weekly perspective, this is just a bear flag. And a measured move here certainly takes us down at least to these lows, if not a little bit further, if I missed on the uh, complete measure of that flagpole. So 162.50. Big, big concern here in the IWM. Remembering all 
also that this is really indicative of risk on versus risk off in our marketplace. Small caps are currently signaling risk off. They're screaming risk off with this big divergence from what the other broad market ETFs were doing in the past week's worth of trade. Let's knock it on down to the daily time frame chart and evaluate what's going on here. Again, clear as day that you can see the look above and fail above 176.50, completely failed, fell apart on the Tuesday session and spent a couple of days of consolidation inside the midpoint of this range, not even an attempt to break over that Wednesday high on the uh, Thursday session. So all things considered, it is technically, if you just want to be a day trader, a scalper here, it's an inside bar setting up. If we break the two double top uh, highs there, you're looking for 176.75, reevaluate when we get here. If we put in a lower high, you know the deal. The bottom end of the range is the target 171. The only case in which the IWM becomes bullish once again is a confirmation daily higher low above 176.75. I would not even think about just like an hourly higher low forming here and then thinking about longs, right? It's got to be a daily higher low there. This chart just looks abysmal compared to many of the other things we've seen so far on today's session. If you've made it to this point in the video, I'm sure you're enjoying the analysis. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so you know every single time a new video comes out. And with that, we'll dive right into Apple. Notice that we have a beautiful break, retest, and rotation back higher off of prior structure here around 161.25. The setup is the exact same as what we covered on the Wednesday session. Looking for a break of the two equal highs to get into the equal high here from a larger trend perspective at 167. To give you the number, I would want to see price acceptance above 164. 85. The bears only have something going on with a lower high underneath 161.25. Next up, we're going to take a look at Netflix, continuing to give us that break and retest type look as well. You'll notice that we had our bull flag break, retest another hammer candle on the Thursday session, respecting our full gap close at 332.50. Daily 50 estimate, the idea remains the same, long over the hammer high, looking for the equal high at 348.50 in the upward direction. From there, just walking up the targets, bears only have something going on lower high under 332.50. Next up is Tesla. Nice looking hammer candle on the Thursday session, sort of towards the bottom of the range, but not really in a location yet where I would have confidence in an upside move. Notice that it's completely under the bottom of the range from in here. So there's still an opportunity that a fake break occurs over the Thursday high. We stuff off of 188.50 and then rotate back in the downward direction. The first target would be the completion of the level here at 177.65, and then we have 1 168.35 for longs. It's got to be, again, we need confirmation in this market context right now. It's got to be a higher low above 188.50. Next up, we've got Google. Big outperformance here. This was one that we were actually advocating for in the Wednesday night update, saying that it was a cup and handle within a cup and handle. And we certainly got the first one to break in the upward direction. Looking for the second, the larger one to break in the upward direction as we did get the candle close above 107.75. Next overhead target 110.75 and 113.50 any bullish retests of 106.25 looking to get on board if we can find intraday bullish reversal patterns off of this area or if we just print a simple daily hammer candle down here long over that high looking for continuation bears have something going on with the lower high and failure to hold at 106.25 next up meta what's going on with zuckerberg's fantasy land you'll notice that we're continuing to break out over that 207 area so watching for bulls on parade bullish engulfer on the thursday session closing at the highs after looking underneath the low 221 is still the structural target, but after that, we're going to start eyeballing 234. If this does want to just consolidate out sideways, I would just be patient and say it's still bullish as long as we're above 207. But if it does go sideways, you're just setting up the next breakout point to get to 221 in the first place. The equal highs currently are 216.25. Next up, NVIDIA. What's going on here? This is still the untouchable on the short side. A uh, strong reversal on the Thursday session, looking to close that gap overhead and then seriously reevaluating at 274.25. Why is that? Well, of course, you could start to imagine how this does turn into a head and shoulders pattern, and all of a sudden, this, na well, I shouldn't say nasty, but massive, rather, run that NVIDIA's been on comes to an end based on this technical formation. The flush would be underneath 262 in the downward direction. So watching that closely, still fairly skeptical about new money longs here at terrible trade location. Next up, Softy, what's going on with Gates and uh, his partnership with NVIDIA and the whole AI landscape? You can see a strong breakout, so more sort of aligned with the move that we saw in Google in the upward direction here. 
would be sort of skeptical. Well, it is day one of a breakout, but the concern is that we've come all the way from the bottom, testing prior resistance as new support, to breaking the top of the range in one day. So sure, we could see a day two follow through move, but you're only looking at 294 as overhead resistance. I would be very, you know, in and out of Microsoft. I would not overstay my welcome in the long direction until we can really either prove higher lows above 289.25, this breakout point here, and then we start to eyeball the next structural target, 305. If we just kind of like hang around here, it's tough to be a new money long at resistance, literally at 294. So kind of a patience play, but maybe a little bit of follow through from a day two type move out of Microsoft. Bears have something going on as we sort of have talked about. That's the theme, right? Underneath 281.50. Next up, last but not least, the mini beast. What's going on with Amazon? This is our laggard not being as involved in the AI landscape, it seems at least. Uh, certainly produced a candle that looks very structurally similar to what we've been talking about in the QQQ, right? Sweep the lows, close back at the highs, looking for the equal high to be produced, and then follow through up and over 103.90. Daily 200 SMA, 108 becomes a target. Thin structure off to our left. Amazon is actually looking quite attractive for a long off of this very mild pullback and hold of the previous structure at 101.25. Last reminder to hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, all that good stuff YouTube tells us to tell you about. And let's jump right into these trade ideas. WM Waste Management is up first. If this breaks the top of the flag, looking for a move over 164.80 to rotate to these previous highs at 169 flat. If the market does see a deeper pullback in the coming weeks worth of trade, this also could be perceived as a short setup breaking down under the bottom of the balance range, the flag consolidation, right? At 162.35 gets us through thin structure to potentially close this gap from the breakout point all the way down around 157.14. So willing to go either way, I will say that we have an inside bar inverted hammer on the Thursday session. So potentially watching for downside outcomes first if the market sees early week weakness. Next up, let's take a look at SBUX for Starbucks. What's going on with the coffee shop here? Certainly looking at a very similar structural pattern, but the flag is a little bit more pronounced and we have a hammer candle instead of an inverted hammer. So looking for a break in clearance over 105, potentially 106, if you want to account for these prior pivots as well. Looking to rotate through the thin structure and achieve this prior swing high at 109 on the upside. The same thing could be said about the lows, but again, with the hammer candle and the buyers stepping up on Thursday's low, daily 50 SMA is meeting us here for super support as well. Wouldn't be as convinced about the downside trade in Starbucks as opposed to WM. Next up, we've got TTD, the trade desk. What's going on over here? Big bullish engulfer on the Thursday session, closing up near a breakout point over 61.32, looking for the rotation into 66.15. This one's fairly straightforward. Nothing to really mention on a uh, sort of flip side of the coin. SHOP, Shopify. What's going on with trade idea number four? It's packed this week with trade ideas. Hammer candle, very similar. I forget the setup that we were looking at, which is kind of uh, maybe it was the XLY, actually. XLY, now that I'm thinking about it, strikes me as being similar, right? Hammer candle at the support trend line, break of the hammer high, recapture the daily 50 SMA, looking for the rotation to the equal high, and then follow through to close the overhead gap to here from the previous earnings cycle. So that does strike me as interesting. The psychology from the Thursday session is also extremely interesting, right? We open on a gap down, we push lower, and how do we close the day back inside of Wednesday's range? So looking for the buyers to put in a little bit more strength, reverse this market, and move it up and over that hammer high 4563 rotation is to 48 first and then the gap close is 5017 next up last but not least is v and this is a longer trade idea to potentially watch out for it's just the idea that we're building an inverted head and shoulders maybe this is the neckline maybe this is where the breakout really happens from it's a pricier stock right so if you want to trade long dated options on it maybe you just pick up one or two if we get the break in the first place of these areas of resistance but the same idea really uh, happens here right we have this breakout point from a a prior wedge that was forming on the daily time frame chart break retest hammer on the Thursday session looking for longs over the high and the rest is kind of history from the longer inverted head and shoulders pattern that we were just discussing that's what I've got for you on today's episode of the weekly watch list if you enjoyed the video or learned anything new let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a simple thumbs up I hope to see every single one of you in the pre-market prep live at 8 30 on the Monday session and in the meantime enjoy your long holiday weekend I wish all of you a green trading week Thank you.